Hello and welcome, I'm Maria from So Through Time, and this time we're taking a look at the mid-Victorian 1850s fashion and making a dress from that era. The interesting part about the mid-19th century fashion is that fashion kind of doesn't change a lot in that era. In the earlier part of the 19th century, fashion changed really drastically and really fast. And basically, you can see a new trend almost every single year. But when we get to 1840s, things start to slow down and trends become very gradual and not a lot is happening. The silhouette gets bigger and bigger in the skirts, but it's basically just a big bell-shaped skirt. So when we start from the 1840s fashion, there first we still have the voluminous skirts that were popular already in the 1830s. But the skirt hem goes down gradually throughout the 30s and by the 40s it is ankle length or slightly longer and it stays there for basically all of the rest of the Victorian era if we're talking about fashionable daytime dress or evening dress up until the 60s. In the 60s you just start to see the first trains and like I said, the skirts can keep on getting more voluminous and more voluminous. So in the 1840s, you have the basic bell-shaped skirt. It is basically made out of two rectangles or several rectangles, depending on how wide your fabric is. And then it is just pleated or gathered to the waistband or the waist of the dress. And this basically, this basic shape of construction is standard up until the 1860s when you start seeing other shapes also used. And the way they create the volume to this skirt is by first corded petticoats and sometimes horsehair petticoats and then just layering and layering petticoats on top. And by the mid 50s you start seeing three, four, even seven petticoats worn at once. And these petticoats are always heavily starched so that they basically stand on their own to create enough volume. And they can also be flounced to help create the volume also on the lower part because the petticoats are again constructed out of rectangles and then just gathered to the waistband or pleated to the waistband, usually gathered. And because this creates a very strong silhouette where it very much flares straight from your waist, sometimes it can be helped with adding a few flounces. And to create more of that, because by the time we get to the 50s, the silhouette starts becoming wider at the hem. So a lot of times even the dresses themselves will have flounces on top. Now, creating the volume on the skirts with this many petticoats becomes heavy and kind of cumbersome and it can also be quite hot when there is more and more and more petticoats layered. So eventually, by 56, the hoop skirt or hoop crinoline was developed and this was basically made by different adding metal wires to the petticoat. Sometimes they have fabric on top of them, sometimes they're just the wires. And this helped with a lot of weight and also with warmth. This would also create a lot more uh, free space for your legs. So not only could you free uh, walk more freely, but also it would create kind of your own air conditioning underneath your skirts, which could be very practical in the warmer climates. And because these hoop skirts were so much more practical than having multiple petticoats, they were fairly quickly adapted by women. But you do st still see for work dress and more casual at-home wear also worn just petticoats. So as the hoop skirt becomes the standard undergarment, skirts start to grow in volume very fast and also they become more and more volume at the bottom because you're not relying anymore on starched petticoats for the silhouette or cording so it isn't so top heavy bell shaped but rather a gradual slope. So while this change is happening in the skirts mostly in the later part of the 50s in the beginning of the 50s the bodices change drastically. You do still see from the 1840s, the fashionable full-on dress where the bodice is connected to the skirt. 
and they are usually buttoned in the front and they usually have hooks and eyes to rigged onto them so that the skirt still opens at the side but the very fashionable option to that becomes a separate bodice and this usually has a peplum or a jacket shape now these jackets could be matching to the skirt the same way as a dress would be and they were then considered dresses even though it was a separate jacket or peplum bodice and a skirt or they could be completely separate in a different pattern or different fabric the other big change in bodices is sleeve shape we go away from the 1840s severe sleeves and the most fashionable sleeve throughout the 50s is the pagoda sleeve it does carry on into the 1860s and the silhouette of this era is a very extreme hourglass not exactly because the corsets were very tight but because you have these big luminous pagoda sleeves and then you have the nipped in waist and then you have these enormous skirts so it creates the illusion of a very small waist and a very sloping shoulder so a very soft feminine silhouette because the ultra feminine silhouette of the mid 19th century is perceived nowadays as the kind of fairy princess look and that is often seen as like the epiphany of victorian male domination over women and women's oppression it is often perceived as a very oppressive silhouette and oppressive style and fashion but that's kind of a silly way of looking at it because at least from a victorian perspective because like today men like to make fun of women for wanting to dress in fairy princess dresses back then the same was absolutely true victorian men made so much fun of women for wearing these sort of fashions and hoop skirts especially were very much ridiculed and the safety hazards with wearing big hoops and then having your skirts so far away from your body that they could set on fire potentially even though that did occasionally happen a few times it was very much over exaggerated in the media of that era because men absolutely hated these fashions and hated the fact that they couldn't influence women to stop wearing them and one reason for ridiculing these styles was not only the way they looked but also the actual physical space they took because men really hated women taking up space whether it be emotionally or physically and because with these big skirts women were physically taking up a lot of space and i think that's one of the reasons why they became fashionable at this time is because women's rights movement was really starting in this era a lot of women were really starting to question out loud the system and its norms and the fact that women didn't really have rights and didn't have the right to vote or a voice publicly and because these kind of coincide together i i don't think that's an accident because there has been previous eras also where women started physically taking up much more room with their big skirts and every time there's pushback from men every single time so i kind of see this as a thing that happens in fashion because of the way that women are treated and because women are trying to politically gain more power another good example of this is the elizabethan era where women would wear these huge kind of drum shaped farthingales that really took up a huge amount of room and men absolutely hated them and that's kind of one of the reasons why they stay in fashion basically all of elizabeth's reign is because there is a woman in power and you can see it fading fairly fast after she dies because women politically are losing that momentum that they gained during her rule but that's of course just my theory i'm not actually a political historian or anything so i'd love to hear in the comments down below that what what are your thoughts on this does this sound like a plausible theory to you or do you maybe have a different view on this subject?
If you liked this video so far, please hit that thumbs up button because it really does help out in this algorithm world. And now let's get to the making of the dress. For the base of my pattern, I'm using the 1840s Black Snails Daygown pattern, and I'm just modifying for it from that based on what I'm seeing in Patterns of Fashion 1. <laughs> The sleeves I'm drafting directly from Patterns of Fashion. And then I non-historically accurately serge all the edges because my fabric grays like crazy. Then I fit the bodice on myself. This is a little fiddly because I'm fitting it on myself and not a mannequin, but it can be managed as long as you have good arm mobility. And then I sew the changes to the bodice. Then I pin the darts in place and do a final fit check on the back. You can see that there's some weird tugging and pulling and wrinkling in the back, but that's ma mainly because of the seam allowance being unclipped. I've sewn the pagoda sleeve upper and lower part together with the linings and now I pin them in place to fit each other. Then I hand sew the lower part to the upper part of the pagoda sleeve, making sure to catch only the lining on the upper part so that it isn't visible on the right side. Then I machine stitch the vertical seams on the sleeve and hand fill the seam allowance on the inside. And then I make bias piping to finish the neck arms eye and waistline of the bodice. I first sew the piping onto the sleeve and then from the right side sew the sleeve onto the bodice. The front edges are sandwiched together and sewn down. Then I hand work my buttonholes with a buttonhole twist. And then I make thread or death heads buttons out of the same silk twist. Unfortunately the camera really didn't want to focus on my hands but basically you just twirl the thread around in a a square pattern so that it finally covers the entire button. The skirt portion is just two rectangles sewn together and gathered into a waistband. And here is the finished dress. Based on the size and shape of the skirt, this ensemble ends up being from about 52 to 55, but I would personally probably put it on the earlier part of that. I am wearing a corded petticoat and two starched ones underneath. And because the picota sleeve leaves so much of your arm bare, a separate undersleeve is worn like I'm wearing here. And because we're in an era where outer garments were often made out of materials that can't be easily washed, it is important to protect your outer clothing from your body oils. So that's why a chemisette was often worn, not only to give you that collar around your neck, but also to protect that part of your chest that is not covered by your chemise, because these were much easier to launder than the full gown. All in all, I'm quite happy with how this came together. And though this typically would have been a dress in the era where the bodice and the skirt are sewn together, I kept them separate so that I can wear the skirt with an unmatching bodice as well. I'll leave you with these few detail shots of the bodice, and I hope to see you again next time. Bye!